Man, why don't you go ahead and have a seat? And uh, I'll just say again, welcome to Bell Road Church. So glad that you're here and that you've joined us this morning. My name's Tyrone, by the way, and uh, I'm the pastor here. And uh, man, if you are guests here this morning, thanks for joining us. I want to just say hello to the Mac family. It's great to have the Macs here. You guys are amazing pastors, leaders. They have uh, been great people for the kingdom of God in this city, in this state. And so we honor you guys and thank you. Uh, you guys for joining us here this morning. It's fun to have you. And uh, anybody else that's here for the first time, it's so great to have you here. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we're a church that likes to have fun. And we're also a church that wholeheartedly, unashamedly believes that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's, you're going to hear that in the message this morning. So hopefully I'm not repeating myself too much. But I'm excited for this message because it's week three, part three of this series that we are titling the problems with Christianity. And so what we're doing in the series is we're looking at these, these things, these issues that people would take in regards to Christianity, problems they would have, and they'd say, I don't believe in Jesus, I'm not a Christian, I don't want to have anything to do with that or church, because I have issues with these types of things. Like, how, how on earth do you, can you base your life on an old-fashioned book? Is this book even true? That's what we looked at last week. How can you prove that God exists? How do you know that God is real? Well, today we're looking at this question, do all roads lead to heaven? And a lot of people would say that. Don't all roads lead to heaven? So it doesn't really matter what you believe. Go ahead and pick your religion, pick your belief, pick your worldview. It doesn't matter. In the end, we all end up in the same place. And I think that if we're honest with ourselves, deep down inside, we all kind of like that idea. And the reason that a lot of people believe in that and or at least struggle or wrestle with that question is because we want to make sure that we end up in the right place at the end, Right? And we like the idea that other people are going to end up in the right place as well. And so it feels good to believe that. It feels like that could be a good thing. Like in the end, it doesn't matter. Just be a good person and we'll be in the right place at the end. And a lot of people believe this. This is their world view. In fact, interestingly enough, one rabbi, he actually said this. He said, I am absolutely against any religion that says one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that it is anything different than spiritual racism. Mahatma Gandhi, he's famous for saying this. He said, my position is that all great religions are fundamentally equal. Oprah said, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe that there's only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to God. And interestingly enough, Oprah would consider herself a Christian. She calls herself a Christian, but she's very open with all this. She's like, it doesn't matter, though, really. All religions end up in the same place. So this idea is called inclusivism. Let's be inclusive of all worldviews and all religions and include them all. You know, atheism would say all religions are wrong. Inclusivism would say all religions are essentially right, or at least parts of them or most of them are right. So that's inclusivism. There's this scene in one of the Ricky Bobby movies that kind of really epitomizes this whole <laughs> inclusivism, if I can use this as an illustration. Ricky Bobby feels like he's on fire. He thinks he's on fire. He's running around and he's praying. And as he's praying, he's calling out to any God he can think of. So he's like, help me, Jesus. Help me. What does he say? He says, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jewish God. Help me, Allah. Help me, Tom Cruise. Use your science to get this fire off me. <laughs> help me, Oprah Winfrey. He prays to Oprah Winfrey. Okay, so... That, in a nutshell, is, is really the, this idea of inclusivism. Let's just call out to all the gods, believe in all the gods, and we'll cover all of our bases just to make sure we're safe. And a lot of people would say it doesn't really matter, so you can feel free to pray for all of them, feel, or to all of them, and believe in all of them. Or, if there is one that's true, at least I'm calling on that one that's true, and in the end I'll find out which one was the true one. And so... That's kind of the idea of, of inclusivism, and we like this because we want to make sure that we end up in the right place. And this is why people have a hard time with Christianity, because people look at Christianity and say, it's way too exclusive. How dare you say there's only one way to heaven? What gives you the nerve to actually believe there's only one way? People would say it's narrow-minded, you guys are, are bigots, you're, you're selfish, you're elitist to say that you have the only way to heaven. So people have a hard time with Christianity because of its exclusivity. So they embrace inclusivity. I would say perhaps this is the biggest reason or, you know, one of the biggest reasons why people take issue with Christianity. It's too exclusive. 
And you couple that with this whole thought of how can a, a loving God, you say God's loving, how can he send people to hell? So those two things don't compute for people. So you say there's only one way to heaven, and if you don't choose that way, they don't believe in your God, then your God who loves them is going to send them to hell, and so they don't like that. It's way too exclusive. And so people like this idea of inclusivism. And again, it feels good. We'd like to ascribe to this and, and like to think this is true, but when you dive deep into inclusivism, you realize there's holes to inclusivism. There's actually some problems you find, okay? Number one would be inclusivism is still exclusivism at its core because in trying to be inclusive, it ironically ends up excluding the exclusivists, right? (laughs) Okay, another problem is inclusivism has a premise that's still exclusive in nature. When they say, I have the true, I have the exclusive way of thinking about all the religions of the world while trying to be inclusive, that is a very exclusive statement. And so there's contradictions even within inclusivism. It's like the debate between truth and relativism. There's been that tension in that debate for the last 20, 25, 30 years where people would say, there is such a thing as absolute truth. I believe in that. There has to be. And other people would say, no, 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 no. Truth is relative. There's no absolute truth, so whatever you believe to be true, if you believe it, and if that works for you, awesome. But I believe this, so this is my truth. And so that sounds good again. It, can, it, it feels good, because then I'll make, I don't upset anybody. I don't make anybody, anybody mad. If you believe that to be true, good for you. My truth is this, okay? The problem comes when, what happens when those two truths are completely contradictory? Both cannot be right. That's not possible, is it? You can't have two contradictions and then say, well, they're both true. No, one of them's true, one of them's false, or they're both false. I guess that would be another option as well, right? You know, what if you said to me, Tyrone, I see you're wearing a hat today in church. But I say, no, I'm not. You say, yes, yes, you are. I, I see this wearing a hat. Why are you wearing a hat in church? I don't, I don't believe that I am. I don't, I'm not wearing a hat. I would never wear a hat in church. Yeah, you're wearing a hat. No, I believe that I'm not. Okay, so if I claim that to be my truth under tolerance and relativism and all that kind of stuff, that's my truth, my truth, and you have to accept that. But they they contradict each other, right? Either one is true or the other is true. They both cannot be true. So that's the debate between truth and relativism, and that's what, it's the same thing with this whole inclusivism. There's holes, there's problems. It ends up, in the end, contradicting itself. So I say the bottom line when it comes to inclusivism is it's a worldview based upon a contradicting system of thought that we probably should just push aside because it doesn't make sense logically and it doesn't stand up to reason. And on top of that, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, then there's no way I can embrace inclusivism. It goes against the core teachings of Jesus who said in John 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus, in that statement, okay, so those are his words. We didn't make that up, right? His words. And that's what, usually my first pushback is, why do you believe there's only one way? Well, I, I, I didn't make it up. So it's not my thoughts. It's not my opinion. It's, it's God's opinion. So that's, I'll start there. And I believe that to be true. But, you know, I get your point. If we were to make up a religion, we would, it would make sense. Just be a good person, and in the end, we'll be okay. But when we look at all of this and the things we're going to talk about today, we realize, ah, there's got to be truth. Where do we find truth? Who makes up truth? Who, who decides all this? And Jesus has some claims that we have to look at. And then he himself says, I am truth. What's he saying? He's saying, I am absolute truth. You will find absolute truth in me. So if I embrace inclusivism, I have to reject the teachings, the core teachings of Jesus and the apostles throughout the rest of the New Testament. So, this is why people have a hard time with Christianity. It's way too exclusive. You can't claim there's only one way. Well, the interesting thing about that is every religion claims exclusivity. That's kind of the point of religion, wouldn't you think? Here's the way of living and here's what you're going for. And so if people are going to throw out Christianity based on, well, it claims to be exclusive, and so therefore it can't be right, well, then you have to throw out every religion, because all religions claim exclusivity, and therefore you'd have to throw them all out, and you can't study them all and can't look at them all. 
Christianity seems to get the hit and the knock for this. I think a lot of people don't want it to be true or don't like that it could be true. I was just talking with somebody in between services there. They said their, uh, I think it was nephew, is taking a world religions class in college, but they don't study Christianity because they don't want to look at that. They're study, but they're studying all the other religions of the world. So that's interesting. I'd be curious to know why they chose to do that. And it probably would center around this issue of exclusivity. But again, that's the point of religion. Here's the exclusive way of living, and here's what you're going for, right? So with that in mind, let's, let's do a little compare and contrast at the world's major worldviews and the world's major religions. And so what I'm going to do is just give you a brief synopsis of what you're going to read through in your book this week, which, uh, again, this, these, these sermons, they go on coincide with the study that we're doing in our life groups and this book that we're reading. And so if you're not in a life group, if you haven't got a book yet, I would highly encourage you after the service to go buy a book out in the lobby and find a life group. We want to see you get plugged in and and discussing this, wrestling through these questions, especially this this study this week. This is a good comparative religion study that you're going to go through this week. So you get a lot more details. I'm just going to go, just basically do a flyover of the major religions. So let's look at the top seven religions, or the top seven worldviews. Number one is Christianity with over 31% of the world's population. Number two would be Muslims, okay? Islam is the second biggest religion with over 24% of the world's population. Then there's this non-religious group. That is 16% of the population. We'll look at that in detail a little bit later. Then you have Hindus at 15.1% and Buddhists, 6.9%. You got a bunch of folk religions and other that round out the last, uh, essentially, 6%, 7% of the world's population. So, as you look at these numbers here, you can see that over 93% of the world adhere to the top five worldviews. Now, if you were to study religions and say, I want to find out which one is the true one, which one's accurate, you'd probably want to start with at least the top 10 in the world, right? Most of the world, with 97 to 98% of the world, adhere to these top 10 religions, so you'd probably want to look at those. And over 93% ascribe to these top five worldviews, likely you're going to find it in there if you're going to look for and discover a true religion, right? Would that make sense? And so let's look at these different religions and let's compare what they they mean and what they claim. Start with Islam. Islam believes there's only one God, Allah. Allah. The focus of Islam is submission to Allah. Here's their central beliefs. It centers around the five pillars of faith. You gotta recite the Shahada on a regular basis, which you've probably heard this before. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. You gotta pray five times a day, facing Mecca, give alms to the poor, fast during the month of Ramadan, and perform a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once. Those are the five pillars of the faith for Islam. Islam. If you live a life and faithfully do these things, then you can earn entrance into heaven for them, which they call heaven, paradise. The description of paradise, when you look at how it's described all over the Quran, uh, it's interesting because it's great for men, but it's not so great for women, unfortunately. But the Quran describes a big party, great place, celebration, couches in big gardens, lots of fruit, Rivers of wine, that all sounds great. Uh, But also in heaven, uh, each man will have lots of virgins. So this is their view. And, uh, you know, it's easy for us to laugh in settings like this. But honestly, guys, people are giving their life to this. And they really wholeheartedly believe this. And so it's important for us to know. And even respect them in this. Like, I don't want to put anybody, if you believe this, I don't want to put you down. But I want to be able to know this so I can have conversations with people about this. Right? At least 18 places in the Quran, Allah does command his followers to fight and kill the enemies of Islam. 18 times, fight and kill any enemy to Islam, which is why this religion ends up being very militant. It's commanded 18 times by Allah. And so then, you know, there's this new wave of, you know, trying to make Islam not seem so militant. And so basically what they're doing then is they're taking out some core teachings of Allah in changing their religion. Contrast those teachings with the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. And even then we get pushed back on like, well, what about the Crusades? Okay, which 
unfortunately, it's a pretty dark time for Christianity as a whole. When they went and conquered the world and forced Christianity upon people, okay, that was not Jesus' way. Okay, he would not have wanted people to do that. So, yes, we needed to uh, repent and ask for forgiveness probably still for that because that's not the right way. That's not what the Bible teaches us to do. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for your enemies. And uh, so there's a better way of spreading the message of the gospel. So you look at Islam and Christianity and you say two different religions, right? Okay, let's look at Hinduism. His, Hindus, they believe that the Brahmin is the universal spirit, which is everywhere and in everything. It is an unconscious, impersonal force that governs the whole universe, which is where we get the concept of the force in Star Wars, right here from Hinduism, right? Okay, so Hinduism originated right around 3000 BC, when the ancient Hindus looked around at the world and they noticed a sort of, kind of like a hierarchy to the world. And they saw, well, the worms get eaten by fish, and the fish get eaten by cats, and the cats get eaten by coyotes, and the coyotes get eaten by mountain lions, and the mountain lion gets captured by the game warden so that the mountain lion won't eat the game warden's children and, and put away. But then the game warden eventually does die and gets buried in the ground, and the worms eat the game warden. So they notice this, there's a cycle and a hierarchy to life, and with that, they developed their, their thought system, their thought process. So for them, it centers around this whole idea and concept of reincarnation. We're going to be reincarnated to a lower level or to a higher level after life, and it's all dependent upon the karma that we have in life. By the way, the New Age movement that was birthed in our country and in Western world was birthed out of Hinduism. So much similarities for New Age and Hinduism, but they changed some things too, you know. New Age started teaching that we're all gods, there's a God in all of us. So, you know, Americans especially didn't like the thought of I could be reincarnated to a lower level. I want to just follow the religion that does the higher level thing. And so they took the lower level thing out and they said the God in you won't allow you to go to a lower level. And so they tweaked some things, but that's where New Age thought came from. It kind of was birthed out of this Hindu way of thinking. Okay, so what do Hindus think about heaven? What's their view of heaven. What happens after you die? Well, this is what they say. The ultimate goal is to achieve a state of being called nirvana, which I know you've heard that before. Nirvana. This is where you're completely one with the Brahman of the universe. Nirvana means, literally translated, it means blown away. And that's the goal, is that your conscious becomes one with the the, the universe and essentially becomes unconscious with the universe and you're literally just blown away. You kind of cease to exist. That's the goal of Hinduism. This pathway to get there, though, it involves multiple lifetimes of making sure you live well and you die well. So that you have good karma, right? It's based upon karma. Hindu scholars would say it takes roughly 600,000 lifetimes to achieve this nirvana. Okay, so that's Hinduism. Now you got Buddhism. What does Buddhism believe? What do they think? Interestingly enough, Buddhism was born and birthed out of a rejection of Hinduism. So Buddhism would say, I'm not going to ascribe to Hinduism. It's wrong. This is the better way or the right way. It claims to be more exclusive in its thinking and in its way than Hinduism is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so what's, what's Buddhism? Okay, it was founded by a guy named Siddhartha. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he was born approximately 563 B.C. to a high, uh, a high caste Hindu family in Nepal. But when he's about 40 years old, he didn't like the teachings and the thinking and the way of life with uh, Hinduism, so he started rejecting that. He went and sat underneath a tree, he said, for 40 days and 40 nights, and in this process, he was enlightened. And so for the last 50 years of his life, he was called the Buddha, which means the enlightened one. And he began to teach everything that came to him as he was enlightened. And so this is what he taught, four noble truths. These are the central beliefs to Buddhism. Suffering is universal. Craving is the root cause of suffering. The cure for suffering is to eliminate craving, and you eliminate craving by following the Eightfold Path, which is these things right here, right views, right thought, right speech, right behavior, right occupation, right effort, right contemplation, and right meditation. So here's the goal. The goal is, is that you're trying to be free from pain and suffering in life. That's the goal if you are going to ascribe to Buddhism. They don't focus too much on the afterlife. It's more about the life that we have here and now and how we can overcome suffering and essentially avoid it all. So what you gotta do is you gotta follow this eightfold path 
And then as you do that, the Buddha taught that you could achieve enlightenment. Enlightenment literally means that you're detached from the world and its cares. So you're completely t- detached from that. This is what Buddhism would teach. Those who love a hundred have a hundred woes. Those who love ten have ten woes. Those who love one have one woe. But those who love none have no woes. And that's the goal, that you would love nothing so you experience no pain and no suffering. Even Buddha himself, as he launched this and started this, he left his family and left his children so he could have no attachment to worldly things to step away from all desire and all love so that he couldn't be experiencing pain, essentially, and suffering. So that's the premise of Buddhism, and, uh, and, and that's the, the goal in that. Their view of heaven is, is, is a nirvana as well. You're, you're, you're trying to achieve nirvana. It's a bit different from Hinduism. They believe in six realms of existence, but the goal is still enlightenment into this. So I think it's safe to say that Buddhism is very different from Christianity. Don't you believe? Very different. Okay, Christianity, we also believe that suffering is a part of life, but we actually can learn and grow from suffering. We also believe that cravings are a part of life. In fact, cravings and desires is actually how you and I can enjoy life. And so what we want to do with God's help is learn to say no to the right cravings and yes to the right cravings because there are sinful cravings that we all have. And so we're trying to, you know, continue to step into that new creation, be that new creature that God has called us to be and say no to the old creation, the old self. And so with God's help, we say yes to the right things and we say yes to the right desires. We actually enjoy life. And so it's different than what Buddhism would teach. So let's move into this fourth category, the non-religious. Who are these people? These people would be the atheists, the agnostics, the secular humanists. These are people that say none. They check the box none when they're asked their religious preference on a survey. This, by the way, is the, has been the fastest growing sector of society in the last 20 to 30 years within our country. That's why a lot of people are studying this. They call it the rise of the nuns. All these people now are claiming none as their religious preference. So what are these people's central belief? Well, they're all over the place because they're, they're there for different reasons. They believe different things, even as they have no religious preference. So some say there is no God. Some would say if there is, there's no way we can know him. Live to please yourself. If it feels good, then do it. There's no view of heaven because this life is all we have. Or a lot of people would would ascribe to this thought, all roads lead to heaven. So we're all going to end up in the same place. And so all of those beliefs can be found within this non-religious sector. And this is a very important people group for us to understand. Within five miles of this room right here, there are 270,000 people. And would you know that almost one in four of those people would check this box, none. 23% of the people within a five-mile radius of our church, of this room right here, have no religious preference. That's 62,000 people right around us within this world that we find ourselves in. First time I, I saw that, I thought, dear God, that we, you gotta help us. Like, this is our calling. Like this is why you've placed us in this part of the world so we can reach these people that have no religious experience. God, could you use us to show people that you really are the way, the truth, and the life? Could you use us to show people that they can find hope in you? This is an important group for us to pray for and to connect with. But here's the interesting thing about this, these people. A lot of them are very educated. They're very smart. And they know a lot about Christianity. They know a lot about the Bible. They know a lot about science and atheism and Big Bang and all that kind of stuff, and they do a tremendous job of arguing their stance. In fact, a lot of these people know more about the Bible than Christians do, unfortunately, and so they can walk circles around Christians in debates, which is why it's important for us to understand all of these topics and to have this study through apologetics so I can actually have intellectual conversations with people and give a reasoned answer for why I believe all of this. Outside of the Bible told me so. And so did my mom and dad. Okay, we got to move beyond those answers into, here's some reasonable answers. And I can have intellectual conversations with people who intellectually want to push back on anything that's Christian. And so we've got to understand these people. We've got to connect with them. 
We've got to pray for them. This is a very important people group, and almost one in four people around us would select this as their religious preference, the nuns. Okay, now let's look at the last one, Christianity. Christianity is the largest religion on the planet with over 2 billion followers. It's said that over 100,000 people become a Christian every single day. That's pretty cool. Central beliefs of Christianity would be this. It starts with creation, right? Let's look at the gospel right here. Creation. God in his infinite love created all of us so we have a relationship with him. But then the rebellion happened. Okay, starting with Adam and Eve. We've all sinned. We've all rebelled, which broke that relationship with God. And it sentenced us to death for eternity apart from God. But thankfully, Jesus stepped in, being God himself, being fully man and fully God. He stepped in and brought us redemption. In the greatest act of love, Jesus died for mankind on the cross, taking our place of death for the sin and the rebellion that we committed. And so redemption took place through the cross because of Jesus. And, and through that, we can have a restoration in our relationship with Jesus. But here's how. I've got to believe that, and I've got to get to this confession part. I've got to confess my sins. I realize I've sinned. I've rebelled against God. I've done my own thing. God, would you forgive me? Receive his grace. Begin that relationship with him. And at that moment, something amazing happens. God himself, the spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus comes and lives inside of us and empowers us so we can live out this last thing, which is submission to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Okay, so now I have stepped into the kingdom of God. I'm a part of a new kingdom. I'm part of his kingdom. It's not my kingdom. It's not the United States kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. He is my ruler. He's my leader, okay? Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and so I'm walking in relationship with him. Uh, his spirit has empowered me to live this life. He's given us a mission to announce and advance his kingdom. And by the way, someday he's coming back to fully restore his kingdom completely. So right now we experience just a partial aspect of the power of his kingdom. Someday we'll experience it in all of its fullness, in all of its glory. Until then, we've got a mission, okay? So that's the central beliefs right there of Christianity. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And it all centers around this thing called grace, the doctrine of grace. God has given us grace because he loves us. So here's what the Christian would believe. Everybody on planet earth is one prayer away from heaven because of grace. Everyone, you are one prayer away from heaven and a relationship with the creator because of the grace of God. That's the power of the grace of God. Come on, aren't you thankful for the grace of God? So God's grace gives us entrance into heaven and a relationship with God. What is heaven? Heaven is, is a glorious thing. The Bible talks a lot about it. Most importantly, God's presence is there. But the Bible talks about how it's a place of no pain, no tears, no sorrow, no death. I mean, it's just gonna be this glorious place where we live life like it was intended to live. And though, by the way, there's only one way to get there. And it's through knowing and accepting Jesus. So, based upon all of those, we just looked at the top five worldviews. When you look at all those, would you say they all lead to the same place? No. It's not possible, right? We're looking at different roads going in completely different directions. And so for someone to say, ah, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe, all religions are essentially fundamentally the same, what they're saying is, I have never studied any of the religions, I have no idea what they say. That's what you're saying, because if you really look at them, that no, they are fundamentally completely opposite and sending you in different directions. And so as you look at these religions, you want to discern and discover and learn which one is the right one, because they don't end up in the same place. So which one's right? So we've got to test them. So if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write these four things. These are four ways to test every religion. This is not found in your study, in your readings this week. Uh, at least I don't think. I didn't finish the readings for this coming week, but... I don't think it is, but you want to test, I'm still ahead of you. Just didn't finish, okay? <laughs> just want to point that out. Because <laughs> I had to go ahead to prepare for this. But <laughs> here's how you test it. These four main issues, four tests. Uh, it's, the, it's the question of origin. How did we get here? Then the issue of meaning. Why are we here? What's our purpose? The issue of morality. Where do our values come from? And then destiny what happens after we die? Where are we all going as a result of this thing? Is there an afterlife? Is there such a thing as heaven? Those are the four biggest things. And by the way, these are like the deepest concerns of mankind. 
which is why we have religion, because we wrestle with these things. We want to make sense of all of this. Where do we come from? Why are we here? Let's, and so people make up religion because of a deep desire to answer these four core issues. And so you want to take these four issues and compare them and set them up against every religion that you would study and look at. Say, how does this religion answer these questions? And then do their answers make sense? Okay, so as you answer the questions, here's what we need. We need two things. We need reasonable evidence and you need coherence. Reasonable evidence means there's matching evidence that makes reasonable sense. Coherence is this. It's, it's each answer must fit together with the other three. Reasonable evidence and coherence. It's got to make sense. It's got to come together. It can't contradict itself. If your worldview has contradictions, then you probably don't want to base your life on that worldview. That's just my opinion. Now, as I studied all these and looked at all these, I get it. I have a, a certain bias. If you're a skeptic, you would say, Tyron, you're really biased as you present all of this, and, and there's truth to that. Uh, although, I would also say my, my, my bias comes from experiences that I've had with God. So I'm a little biased with that as well which I loved in our last week's study, or the, maybe it was the first week, where this argument of my personal experience with God, how does that really verify that God is real? It's not a very strong argument for someone who doesn't believe and hasn't experienced God, but as soon as they do experience God, it becomes the greatest argument for God. And so I thought, that totally makes sense. I'd never heard that before. Totally makes sense. I have experienced him, and so yeah, it creates a bias in this, but if you look at Christianity, it is the best religion if you want to call it that, it answers all four of these issues. It does the best job of answering this. Ultimately, you got to look at this. If I put my life into this worldview, where is it taking me? Where do I end up? Atheism, well, they believe in nothing, right? There is no heaven. There's no afterlife. So you, this life is all you got. So you end up with nothing. Inclusivism, we already talked about how there's holes in that. But they like to say all roads lead to heaven. But we already see that doesn't make sense. And that's, that's not logical. Buddhism and Hinduism lands you in an interesting place. Essentially, you're, you cease to exist. Your personality is gone. You become one with the universe, and you're just done. That's the end game. That's the end goal. Islam, their view of heaven is paradise. We talked about that. Okay, rivers of wine, uh, lots of virgins, but God isn't there. You see, there's no religion on planet Earth that leads you to God, except for one. Only one leads you to him. So that's why as Christians we say, if you put your faith in Jesus, you can have a relationship with the one who gave you life. Relationship and encounter and experience are only found through Christianity. No other religion claims relationship with God and experiencing and encountering God. Only Christianity does. And the amazing thing about Christianity is this. You add all that to God did all the work for us. He went to great lengths to make sure that we could be in relationship with him. So as you study all these religions, I think it's safe to say that Christianity is set apart from any other religion on planet Earth. It stands far and above logically, even reason. It actually gives you hope. I talked with one person in between services today, and he's like, man, I, I grew up Catholic, and then I went to, he said, I went to New Age, and then I went to atheism, and then I, I found Jesus. He said, and he said, you know what? And all those other religions, not other, the first part of my life, he says, I had no hope. I found Jesus and I had hope. I finally had hope. And I, he says, that's what, they, that's what we need. And I said, you're so right. It's so good. Christianity is so different. That's why Billy Graham said this. I lost Billy Graham just a year ago. There are many religions in the world, but only one Christianity, for only Christianity has a God who gave himself for mankind. World religions attempt to reach up to God. Christianity is God reaching down to man. So for you and I to reject God's offer, to believe in him, to reject the one way to heaven is really to reject relationship with him. That's what we're saying no to. And the real answer to how can a loving God send people to hell is this. He doesn't want them to go there. He has no desire. He actually went to great lengths to make sure they didn't have to go there. But he is loving, yes. 
He's also just in that, and he's going to stay true to his word. He will keep his word. And therefore, he's not necessarily sending people to hell, but people are going to choose their destiny, whether, whether they accept or reject the message of God and the one way he provides. Someone said, we shouldn't struggle and wrestle with why is there one way. We should ask the question, why is there any way at all? God provided that way for us through Jesus. Why? Because he, he loves us. So he doesn't want people to go to hell, and he gave a solution. He freely offered a solution uh, so the people wouldn't have to end up there. So Christianity is different, totally different. I mean, even look at the, the cross. You know, deep down inside all of us, we want love, right? We want to experience and feel love. We all do, deeply, like genuinely. We want forgiveness. We want people to accept us for who we are, our, even with our imperfections. We want justice, too, honestly. Like, life is unfair, and when it's unfair to me and someone else makes it unfair, I want them to experience unfairness, too, right? We want justice. When we see injustice, we want justice to be made. We long for those three, and wouldn't you know, you can find all three of those at one moment in history, and that's the cross that Jesus hung on at Calvary. At the cross, you see love, justice, and forgiveness right there. It was justice because Jesus paid the penalty. Death was deserved because of sin, but Jesus said, I'll take your place. I will take the justice on myself. You don't have to. It was love because he freely did that. I mean, this is the greatest act of love in human history. Jesus willingly went to that place for us. He said, I'll take your place because I love you that much. And as we believe in him and the message and what he did for us, we can receive forgiveness. Forgiveness was offered through the cross. That's why Jesus said these. These are, these are Jesus' words. Before he went to the cross, he said this. He knew he was going there, but this is what he said. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You ever thought it's interesting that Jesus himself said that? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have what? Eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who desires evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. That's what I love about Jesus. Jesus claimed, I am truth. On the way, I am truth. As you and I step into Jesus, we're stepping into truth. What does truth do? Truth brings us out of darkness into light. And in that light, we see Jesus for who he really is. I love this. We sang that earlier. I can see you clearly now. I can see you now. I see it. I was blind, but now I see. I was in darkness, but now I'm in the light. Jesus, you are real. You are truth. And then a few chapters later in John, Jesus says these words. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in Jesus, we find truth. We can step out of darkness into the life, light, and he offers us freedom. And so here's the interesting thing, is if we reject Jesus, what we're rejecting is freedom. And he offers freedom to each and every one of us. Again, there's so much hope in this message that Jesus has for us. Why do I believe in Jesus? Because I believe he's hope. Not to make me feel good about my life and just to have something that's comforting. Come on, if you're going to base your worldview on it's comforting, then you're, you're, you're put in the wrong place. Now, don't get me wrong. My relationship with God has been very comforting at times. But there are people that are giving their life for their faith in Jesus right now. And you ask them, is it comforting? And they would say no. All across the world, people are, are giving their life. They're being martyred for their faith in Jesus. Not because it's comforting, but why? Because it's true. I base my life on truth. This isn't to make me feel good. At times it will, but I'm not gonna throw my whole life into something just so I can feel good about myself, just so I can have a crutch 
when I feel weak and I could walk on this. No, no, it's because I'm, I'm making sure my foundation is truth. And that's what I want to base my life on. If you're going to put your worldview on anything, my friends, can I just say, make sure the foundation is rock solid truth. And that's why we go to Jesus. Would you stand? We're going to pray. We're going to respond to this here. And my prayer is that our faith would be ignited. Our faith would grow, would be strengthened. I think it's good for us to do this little comparative religion thing. We can't be scared. Come on, if we're believing a lie, let's start a, let's start a different church that's believing in truth, okay? I want to put my life into truth. Because what I believe, this matters. So I pray that your faith would be strengthened. Even as you wrestle through some of the stuff, maybe you're struggling with doubts. That's totally fine. Keep wrestling. Keep asking. Get into a life group. Talk through this with people. God is not scared of any of that. I'm convinced of it. Sometimes we are. Don't question your faith, especially in church. It's bad. Oh, you're struggling? Let's talk about it. It's totally fine. It's healthy. That's good. Maybe you're here and you haven't committed your life to Jesus, but you're realizing today's your day. I'm going to give you an opportunity in the next few moments. So let's pray. Why don't you join me in prayer? Lord, we come to you. We're so thankful that we can look to you as truth. Because of that, the foundation of our life can be solid in you. Jesus, you are the cornerstone of our life. You make us strong even when we're weak. You help us through all the storms of life. No matter what happens, ups and downs, we know that we have a firm foundation in you. And Jesus, we're so thankful for that. Lord, I pray that, that by your spirit that you would ignite greater faith and greater confidence in you within us right now. I pray that you do that, especially over this week, Lord, as we study different religions and, look, and, and bring it back to you and your word. What, is, what do you have to say about all this, Lord? I pray that greater faith would grow through all of this. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. For those that are here this morning or listening that maybe aren't in relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. God, I'm believing for a moment for them today. If not today, very soon where they're gonna step out of darkness into the light.